This week, it's the big one. We're going to recreate the moment that changed history. Big Bang! Welcome to Scrap Heap Challenge. It's the show where two teams of extraordinary folk get to build a contraption of our fiendish devising using the useless old junk they find on the scrap heap in just one day. This year it's a knockout competition with eight teams from every corner of the UK in the starting lineup. Last week saw the Brainy Bunch knocked out by Inner Spin, who go through to the semi finals, leaving six teams to fight it out for the three remaining places in the next round and a shot at the Scrap Heap Challenge trophy. This week's challenge is to build a cannon. We provide the explosives, they've got to make the gun. Then they'll get three shots at a target on a Ministry of Defence firing range. Whichever team gets closest to the bullseye will shoot through to the semi-finals. So, let's meet the teams. In the red corner this week are the Chemical Brothers. They're three research chemists who work for a pigment manufacturer in Hull. These guys are keen climbers who aren't afraid to take on the dangerous peaks of Lincolnshire at weekends. When they're not dicing with death, they're building wacky contraptions in their garden sheds. My name's Pat Wesley, and I'm a 33-year-old chemical engineer. Outside of work, I enjoy improvising with all things mechanical, because you can't get the bits for a 33-year-old cow. I'm Paul Hoff. I'm the team captain of the Chemical Brothers. I'm a scout leader, a keen bodger of all things mechanical, and we're really chuffed to be on Scrap Heat Challenge. We think we've got the right formula for success. My name's Rob Flint. I teach shooting in the Royal Air Force Force Reserve. And my real passion is making rockets out of bog rolls. The Chemical Brothers' motto is never be afraid to make a fool of yourself. So they'll get along just fine with their chosen expert, David Rayner, a notorious thrill seeker whose secret passion is reenacting great battles from history. And facing them in purple, it's the brothers in arms. Scrappy veteran Colonel Dick Strawbridge, promoted from Major since his stint in last year's series, is back. And this time he's bringing his private army. I'm Colonel Dick Strawbridge and I'm in the Royal Corps of Signals. I can't wait to get back to the scrap heap and see what the challenges are. And this time I'm bringing my baby brothers with me, so we've got a seriously military team. Crack on, Major. I'm Major David Strawbridge from the Royal Engineers. I'm currently out in Kosovo, but I'll be back on duty for the scrap heap challenge. I'm Captain Bobby Strawbridge. I'm the youngest of three brothers, and like Big Brother Dick, I'm also in the Royal Signals. Being the youngest of the family, I can see that over the course of this challenge, I'll be the lucky one getting all the dirty jobs to do. None of the Strawbridge boys are in the artillery, but they're all armed with dangerous moustaches, and they're not afraid to use them. The Brothers in Arms are joined by Dr. Derek Allsop, a big gun expert from the Royal Military College of Science. He'll be helping the army boys go ballistic. So, my budding bombardiers, the scrap heap awaits, and you have until the sun falls from the sky to complete the challenge. Brothers in arms, chemical brothers, build me a cannon that will inspire the hearts of men. And your time starts now! Go ahead, rounded. Make my day. Good start. Both teams have their own work areas with all the tools they'll need to do the job. But their first task is to work out what they'll need to build their cannon. Shopping list. We need barrel. Barrels a priority. Length or four foot. Four foot or over if we can get it. Four foot minimum. Minimum four foot. What sort of material are these chaps going to be looking for? Strong as possible. What size are we talking about? If you if you've got any RSJ or channel or anything like that, really good beefy stuff. We're talking very high forces. This is one project where weight is good. Yeah, right? the heavier the barrel, heavier the, the barrel, uh, the less recoil, the less recoil we're going to get. Yeah, this has got to be the real business. Derek's right. Although our teams will be building a scaled down cannon, the explosives they're using are real. So their first priority is a very strong barrel mounted on a carriage and wheels. The barrel's sealed at one end to make what's called the breech. The explosive is packed into the breech end behind the projectile. 
When it's ignited, the whole barrel is subjected to enormous pressures, with the breech end taking the brunt of the blast. If everything goes to plan, the projectile will be thrown out of the barrel by the contained force of the explosion. We've got to get out there and get a cannon, get, get, the, ca get, get the barrel, barrel. Right. Uh, a suitable plug. In terms of priority, priority one, barrel. Oh. Yeah. Priority two will be the actual metalwork to around that. And then the carriage, I think the carriage we can will, will take as it comes yeah. along. Yeah, yeah. okay, Sorry. okay, yeah. Do, it. do it. Let's go chaps, let's get it. And they're off to scavenge the junk they'll need to build their cannon from the scrap heap. Bobby thinks he's back on the tank range. Rob has checked out the coach for any gun barrels. Pat's the Red's top climber, but he's not used to scaling piles of scrap. Bobby, what? heavy angle, heavy what? angle, I would Heavy angle, okay. Bobby and David don't know much about artillery, but they seem to think they need lots of pig iron. So, hopefully, if we get the if we get the tolerances right, it's going to be. Expert David is one of those historical reenactment chaps who dresses up in a jerkin at weekends to act out the Battle of Naseby. Not surprising then that the Chemical Brothers have chosen to build a good old-fashioned black powder or gunpowder cannon. It shouldn't kick up like that. It should, it should, if anything, just drop slightly. The army boys, who ought to know about these things, have rejected black powder in favour of a modern explosive, cordite. It's very powerful, so they'll need a super strong barrel. We're approaching 20 tonnes per square inch. Right. Ideally, then I would like to see an inch wall thickness on there. Time to welcome an explosives expert to show us black powder and cordite in action. First, black powder, the oldest known explosive. It's simple, effective, and still used to initiate explosions in modern shells. Oof. So that was the black powder, and now the cordite. Cordite replaced gunpowder as the 20th century artillery explosive. It's practically smokeless and more powerful than black powder. Steve. Tell me a bit about the sort of explosives that the teams are using here today, black powder and cordite. Black powder is the oldest explosive that's been recorded, and it's a very, very good explosive. So what advantage does cordite have over black powder? Well, with black powder, um, 60 to 70 per cent of it stays as a solid. Even though it's burnt, it stays, still stays as ash and dust, so that's what you see as a smoke. Oh, right. Whereas with the cordite, all of it is burnt, it's all, all consumed, and it just turns straight into gas. So it gives it that much more oomph to the, to the shot you're trying to fire out of the gun. So how do explosives fire projectiles out of guns? Well, when you ignite a piece of explosive the size of a pea, it turns into a gas the size of an elephant in a fraction of a second. If that transformation happens within a small space like a gun barrel, the elephant-sized gas wants to get out whatever way it can, fast. And anything in its way, like a projectile, goes with it. <laughs> Climbing, ready. Climbing. Pat's doing his Sherpa impression as he hunts for a cannon barrel. Give us some with this, will you? Oh, my wordy wordy. Yeah. Let's retrieve yeah, it. Pat reckons he's found a good barrel. Keeping it free of dents and cracks is crucial, so they'll be handling it with great care. Mind your head, Rob. Mind your head. OK. It's still in one piece, but it's bigger than Pat. Will their expert go for it? What did you ask for? Yep. <laughs> yep. It's a super strong mains gas pipe. It's spot on. Let's have a look down. And a man from Bosworth Field, he say yes. Woohoo! Yep. The Brothers in Arms artillery offensive isn't going quite so well. They can't find a strong enough barrel. That's not going to work. No. That's not good. Colonel Dick lets his brothers down gently. David, that barrel was of no use. All right, it was no use. We'd still need a barrel with a thick wall. After today, the boys will be going back to the front line for a nice rest. No, 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 no. We need to have at least a half-inch wall. Right. The boys know the bullying won't end till they deliver. Right, this, this is the danger area from about there to there. Right, right. Back in the Red's gunnery, David has a cunning plan to seal the end of their mains gas pipe come cannon. The way they block up the so-called breech end of the gun is crucial. If the seal isn't strong enough, when their black powder is ignited, it could be blasted off, allowing the energy to escape out the back and failing to fire the projectile very far. The Chemical Brothers are planning a traditional breech plug, a piece of metal turned to exactly the right size, which fits tightly in the barrel. 
They then plan to fix steel bolts through the barrel and plug to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Well, that's the theory. But first, the scavengers have to find a good, solid lump of tough metal to make their plug. Ideally, we would like a three-inch piece of stock by about, oh, Christ, as big as you can find it, but failing that, an inch or less. Hang on, what's Rob spotted? Oh, oh yes. We can, we can forget about everything until we have this breach. Okay. Looks like Rob has found a cannon-sized stopper. Oh! You! Oh! You! <laughs> you! Bobby and David are back with another possible barrel. It looks a bit weedy, but it's nice and long, which in theory equals better accuracy. Hey, listen. David. What about that? Hey, well done. Please say yes. No, no. <laughs> Derek, you don't have to say yes, because look at them. They've only started working, these two. It depends upon the thickness of that wall. Time to check the innards of their wussy-looking barrel. Derek reckons it's a hydraulic pipe and very strong. Well, it should be. If it's hydraulic tube, it's have hydraulic fluid in it. It's probably off a car crusher, designed to take hundreds of tonnes of pressure. Of, this is a bit of a super cannon, this length, isn't it? Happy with that. Right, I actually think we're, we're going to go for this. What I'm wondering is, where did this rather nasty idea of firing large lumps of metal at people you didn't get on with first catch on? Gunpowder came to Europe in the Middle Ages, and cannons quickly became an essential part of any self-respecting king's armoury. But it wasn't till the First World War that artillery guns firing explosive shells really took off. In just one day's fighting on the front, 50,000 shells were fired. Big Bertha, named after the daughter of German arms maker Krupps, was the most famous, but others had far greater ranges, some firing shells 60 miles. Big guns were to play a lesser role in the Second World War. But they became crucial weapons in the propaganda battle on both sides. In the defence of Britain, the giant naval Bosch Buster takes its morning stroll to vomit a ton of steel and explosive at the hand. The Nazis responded with unashamedly sizest film of Dora. She fired monster shells weighing a hair-raising seven tons, the weight of ten minis. She took a 300-pound cordite charge and was the biggest gun ever built. The purples have a barrel, but now Derek has to work out how much cordite to use. Not an easy task. You're my expert. You don't expect me to believe that's nearly impossible when you've got a calculator here. That, I do. I am got, got a Pentium computer, I'm afraid. <laughs> Derek knows that the amount of cordite he uses is critical. He must take into account the weight of the projectile they use and its proximity to the cordite in the barrel. Too little cordite and the projectile won't go far enough. Too much and the gun could blow up. It's quite a sizable barrel. Yes. Right. Which you're confident is straight and it hasn't got cracks in or anything like that. Well, this... Even though it's been about a bit, that It's pipe. been around a bit. It's as good as, you know, we, we haven't... Got, we can't do anything more than inspect it. But so, do a bit yeah, of that. Well, that's... You know, <laughs> no, no, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> you trust the expert. <laughs> Big Brother has omitted to tell the boys on the heap he's happy with the barrel. But he and Derek are pressing on, working out how to seal up the end. We've got a tube, yeah? Yep. We need to seal it. Yep. We've got a radical solution to this. Yeah, OK, I don't like radical as a word to be using here, but... OK. You know how recoil... A recoilless yeah, gun works. Do, yeah, So you have a recoilless. Yep. So and, and you just have something there which takes the pressure to begin with and shoots out the back. Yep. Derek's plan is radical, but rather clever. Because cordite is so powerful, there's a high risk of the explosion blowing an ordinary breech plug off the back. He's planning a sophisticated gizmo called a floating breech. It's a heavy plug of metal, but it can move within the barrel. The idea is that when the gun goes off, the breech is heavy enough to absorb the shock for a fraction of a second, just long enough for the explosion to send the projectile out of the barrel. The plug can then fly out the back, where some dirty great springs will absorb its momentum. So, look, is it Ali? It's aluminium. 
Oh, Still bolt it. Doesn't matter. The Reds have discovered that potential breech plug Rob found is made of aluminium. It's a soft and light metal, better known for wrapping sandwiches than plugging the end of a cannon. I think I'd better check the chemist's grasp of metallurgy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah? How's it going? Well, look, that is, that's oh. a gun, isn't it? Yeah. This and is going to be turned down to fit this. That's quite light, though, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it's a gonna, block. We're going to put that in, yeah. put a bolt through it, and yeah. then we're also going to weld we'll the plate, put, on, weld the plate on the end. Weld the plate on the end, right. Uh, and that, that's not going to kind of get squashed by the pressures or little... I, I shouldn't think so. Right. I shouldn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I like the confidence there. Oh, I wouldn't... Oh, definitely well, I wouldn't yeah. think so. Definitely. Are you a bit intimidated by facing the army team next door? No. Not at all. Not the slam. No chance. No. 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 We've heard them sobbing earlier. <laughs> Time to wind up the brothers in arms about the weediness of their weapon. It's a great big piece of scaffold. Pop. No, I'm sure it isn't. Oh, Bob, it's much sexier is than it? that. Thank is you it? very much. Mind, mind the burrs on the end of it. Yeah. Oh. You'll find it's very strong. It's a... And what about the blocky up end bit? We're, we're going to fire the projectile that way and the breach that way. Right. Then we're gonna that, catch has the that got a really good technical name? Yeah, it's called um, Luck. <laughs> Major Dave Reed spent his soldiering life in the artillery and now tests big guns at Britain's Defence Research Centre in Essex, where our team's cannons will be test fired tomorrow. He's come along to cast an expert eye over proceedings and see if he needs to increase his insurance premiums. The red team, the, the, the chemical brothers, are going to use an aluminium block, mm. stuff it up the end and then weld that in. I mean, because that, that sounds, so it doesn't sound very fire well, on, it gonna, sounds a bit they, soft. They're going to seal it that way, that's their way of sealing right. it, but aluminium, not a strong material. Right. Dissimilar metals together, Problem fix the problems there, steel and a match of dissimilar metals, right. one very soft, one very hard, yeah. easy to machine. I think that's why they've gone for the right. option, easy to machine, so possibly, loo to fit yeah. It. Yeah. possibly lose some strength in that area. Yeah. Hodge with the purples, they've got a fairly long barrel there. We should give them better accuracy, in theory, that's the theory, nice accuracy, nice mod of velocity. One of the things that intrigues me is the floating breach, as they described it. Mm. They're, they're... It's a novel concept, but right. interesting to see how it works yeah. tomorrow. It's not a standard piece of British equipment, then? Not you? something I'd like to have equipment. inside a tank. <laughs> David, do you want some shock absorbers? Oh, that, yeah, they'll be nice. They'll have integral springs in. They are absolutely dogs on. Now the teams have found barrels for their cannons, they need to start sourcing top quality components for their carriage and wheels. Back at the army camp, Colonel Dick is assembling their fancy pants recoil system. The junior ranks are scavenging wheels and an axle for their sophisticated gun carriage. Luckily, Bobby and David are both experienced precision engineers. So the Brothers in Arms high-tech supergun is starting to come together. While the Chemical Brothers have got one wheel, a second-hand gas pipe and some bits of metal. But it could all change in part two. <laughs> Welcome back to Scrap Heap Challenge, where some army boys are battling it out with some chemists to make a very big bang. The Brothers in Arms are going great guns with their high-tech plans to turn a hydraulic pipe into a high-velocity weapon. The Chemical Brothers haven't got very far building their gunpowder cannon, but Pat spotted some potential cannonballs. Looks like they're going to use the balls cut off an old iron bedstead as projectiles. Talk about low tech. This is cast. This is beautiful. That's perfect. We've got two. We all need a third. Three and a half pound. The weight's important because the rough rule of thumb is that the cannon and carriage need to be a hundred times heavier than the projectile to help absorb recoil. I can't say I'm entirely convinced by the concept of bed knobs as high-velocity projectiles. Oh, yeah, that's quite heavy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And so I don't know how fast will that be travelling when it hits the wall, isn't it? Is it like hundreds of miles an hour? Uh, about 680 feet a second-ish. <laughs> 900 miles an hour. 900 miles an hour? I think, I th I, I, without looking at the That's tables. very fast. I haven't been that fast. <laughs> not, not recently. No. 900 miles an hour. The Reds are grinding off the rough bits to make their balls into nice, smooth spheres. It's, uh, it's warm, isn't it? It's fairly straightforward. Yeah, but she don't fit all the way around. That's David tries a finished ball in their barrel, 
and it doesn't fit. Incredibly, they didn't check the fit before they did all that work. I thought we had it all sorted. It's a monster balls up. It would take hours to make the balls smaller. It's quicker to chuck them away and start looking for new ones. Let's grab that, Bob. Don't let the, don't let the plug fall in it. Meanwhile, Colonel Dick's undemocratic regime seems to be paying off. Their complicated super gun seems to be coming together. I'm not going to bolt anything on. We're not bolting anything on. Welding is good. Lots of welding. All right. Poor old Derek's still doing his sums. But those army boys are shooting ahead of the opposition. Who don't have anything resembling a gun and are still a few cannonballs short of an armory. But Pat comes up trumps again with some ornamental orbs. Ah, that man has got balls. <laughs> They're a slightly odd size, but hey, I'm not brave. Uh, I'm not busting. It's more ball grinding work for the Chemical Brothers. And here's some more, but these ones look a bit small. She only just rattles. That is as near as we are going to get. Right, so a bit of wadding, a bit of felt wadding. Right, I'll cut, the, I'll cut these off then, yeah, grind them off. David seems to be wrapping one of their balls in carpet felt. Right. We we'll might have to trim it down until it's a nice snug fit. The Reds' balls are a bit small for their cannon, so they're using carpet felt to pack them nice and tightly into their barrel. Without this wadding, much of the energy from the explosion would escape down the sides of the ball and it wouldn't go very far. The wadding provides a crude seal so that the main force of the blast stays behind the projectile, forcing it out of the cannon's mouth as fast as possible. The purple still need projectiles, but the size and shape is up to them. The colonel has sent baby brother out on an ammo hunt. Derek? Derek? Yeah? Perfect. There's nothing in the rules that says they have to use ball-shaped missiles, and Bobby's laid his hands on some hexagonal ones. I don't know what they are. Derek reckons they can be turned into cylindrical projectiles for their gun. What you want? Oh, sorry. Tell me you got something that's worthwhile. It starts off hexagonal, but it's marred steel. That should be soft enough. Derek's drawn the short straw. He's got to shave all the corners off those hexagons to make cylinder-shaped missiles and they have to be precise to a fraction of a millimetre. If he shaves off too much, they're stuffed. Like the reds, the purple cylinder-shaped projectiles must fit snugly in their barrel. But unlike the reds, making them fit with fabric wadding simply won't provide a good enough seal. That's because cordite, although very powerful, burns up very fast. It's essential not to let even a fraction of its short-lived power escape down the sides of the projectile. Instead, they must ensure that they're engineered to fit perfectly. And there's another problem. Cylinders, unlike spheres, tend to tumble through the air like a rugby ball. The purple solution? Tie on bits of string to stream out behind their shell and act as a crude stabiliser. They're going to be a supersonic shuttlecock. It's going to be like a drogue. There's bits of string hanging out the back that, of it. But the same as a shuttlecock. Right, so that's with. what will... That's what'll, cause it, can, it, it could do that if it didn't have that. So that should stay... Well, it, 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 would, it would do that. It could it do that. Go that way around. Yep. It could do that, right. Which it would could be... just tumble. So then you've got no aim at all. While the teams are working up a sweat, time for an update from our judge. The purples are doing quite well, you think? They're, they're, they're doing quite well now. Right. Purples haven't got the projectiles. And they've probably got a bit of machining to do on their projectile because right. they've got to have a fairly good fit and to stop so much of the energy, the gases, the gases, going past the projectile, down the side of the projectile. Right. And now the, the red team have got their... Well, they've got all their bits, haven't they? They haven't really got anything that really resembles a gun that I can they've see yet. But they've, they've got a barrel. They've got, they've got their barrel, <laughs> they've got and they're drilling, they're drilling they're there. The and they're obviously drilling what looks like a touch they're, they're, hole of sorts. Yeah, it's where the fuse goes in, yeah. as it were. They've got their projectiles, they're simple cannonballs. Yeah. Uh, Old-fashioned principle, and known to work, but uh, a lot to do. Lots of bits of kit, like yeah. bits of Meccano. However, it might all change in the next hour when all yeah. these things come together on the red team into a thing that looks like a piece of ordnance. The Chemical Brothers' firing mechanism relies on medieval technology. All they have to do is drill what's called a touch hole. When they're ready to fire their cannon, the reds will load their bag of black powder down the gun barrel, followed by their cannonball and wadding. They'll fill the touch hole with more black powder and feed in an electrical fuse. 
When they fire, an electrical pulse will be sent down the fuse, igniting the black powder in the touch hole and setting off the main charge. Rob's busy at the Red's lathe. He's shaving down their aluminium breech plug to fit their barrel. Yes. But will it fit? All done. You done. If he's taken too much off the all-important plug for their cannon, they're back to square one. Right. Ready? Yeah. Stop it. Action, here it comes. Oh, yes. Here he is. And... Oh, yes! yes! That's it. Gentlemen of the teams, you have three hours remaining. Three hours remaining. Thank you. The Chemical Brothers have found a top-quality motor on the scrap heap, which might provide an axle and wheels for their gun carriage. Ah, yes. Keep going, Frank. Go on. David doesn't know much about axles, but he knows there's something missing from this one. This is a good honest wheel. Meanwhile, Dick and Derek are working on a firing mechanism for their cordite cannon. This goes dunk onto that. Or we could have a tube with a weight. weight. Yeah, tube with a weight. That's, that's we a bit sexy. A... The Purples have been given an explosive percussion cap, a bit like a modified bullet, to ignite the cordite charge in their gun but they have to work out for themselves how to set it off. Their madcap plan is to position the percussion cap above the charge and place a weight with a spike in a tube directly over it. Then on firing, a pin will be pulled, letting the weight drop down the tube, striking the percussion cap, setting it off and igniting the cordite charge. It's a bit like that game Mousetrap. What we have to do is put the percussion cap on there, right, okay, above that is the actual striker, yeah. which will be seated on top of the percussion cap. On the right Dick's full of confidence. Then, when it comes to fire it, by dropping that on top of the, the pad that we have on top of it, it'll strike it and that'll actually set the percussion off. Yep. Uh, but his kid brothers have gone a bit quiet. Yeah. Paul is making sure the breech plug stays put when they fire their cannon. The plug's been bolted inside the barrel, and now he's welding on a metal strap. Sort of belt, braces, and big strappy thing. How's it going then, Pat? It's going very, very it... well. The barrel's you've finished. Your, you've, got your, you've got your breech bolted in. That, yes. Look at that. That's strapped in. Bolted. That's not going anywhere. We hope not. No, that won't go anywhere. <laughs> we really think we've, we've made sure of that. Look at this. Let's pull. The Reds are mounting shock absorbers to their gun carriage. They'll absorb the recoil from the blast and stop their cannon going walkabout when it's fired. As long as these... Yeah, well, it's yeah. lifted, it's yeah. lifted and just... Oh, just diddly. I like their, their shock absorbers. They look very... They're it's really neat work. They're it's only off a moped, though. Is that what they're from? I thought they were from a car, didn't they? No, they're pathetically moped. small, aren't they? I know they're pathetically small. God, they need shock absorbers from a tank. Meanwhile, the Purple's fancy floating breech cum mousetrap firing mechanism is starting to take shape. There's only one thing missing. Derek is still precision milling those projectiles. It's funny, isn't it, thinking that these are actually imitations of machines designed for killing purposes, well, isn't it? I've tried not to let that thought enter my brain, but it has occasionally leaked in when they, you know, it does, yeah, because I mean, that's what they do in real life. the real world. They don't, do, they, don't, they don't use them to sort of build schools, do they? But they do. Or bring some big guns in and build you a hospital. Is not really what happens, is it? Not really, no. But on the other hand, you can't resist the appeal no. of a big, enormous really big bang. <laughs> at very, very high speed. Yeah. Okay. Gentlemen, you have Gentlemen. two hours remaining. Two hours remaining. Thank you. It's all coming together for the Reds, but can their second hand gas pipe barrel really take three explosions? Stop. After repeated explosions, is the, the steel not going to get weakened and it's going to blow up? The steel gets stronger every round because although you change the properties of the steel by expanding it, as yeah. long as you don't take it too far, it then contracts back again and the steel becomes stronger. So, in fact, if it's going to blow up, it'll blow up on the first go. It'll overpress on the first one. And that'll be the end of it. Right. Yes. Can we use... There's just over an hour to go and Colonel Dick is working on the principle that size matters. But he's worried they're still short of projectiles and Derek knows the Colonel is waiting. I've got to just okay. take it off the buzzsaw, yeah? Right. Oh, 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 o
It's the big moment for the Chemical Brothers. Will medium-sized Bertha come together? How does, how does that feel? That looks What's very look professional. Like? That, that looks superb. Yeah. yeah, that looks like... It looks like a gun. <laughs> big gun. <laughs> that last, if you look at it, the last foot looks a bit bent. Stand from back here and twist it. The last bit looks a bit bent. Oh, we better go for a little bit shorter. Colonel Dick's army have a problem with their high-tech supergun. Bobby spotted the tubes bent at the end. The projectile could get stuck when it's fired. Been able to hold it out at this end. Wrong, or at the other end. They'll have to cut the bent bit off. You have 45 minutes left. 45 minutes. Thank you. With time running out, the officers are in a whole new kind of mess. And there's less chance of it moving. I just got this cut now. Oops, Derek. Derek's well out of it, hiding in the lathe shed. What else needs doing well, wise? You're going you to weld two jacks on. Two jacks. Where'll they go? That's okay. Right, I'll do it. Three, two, one, hit. Yeah, we're in now. These are anxious moments for the Reds, too. They've only just learned how to weld at evening classes. Oh, sweet. At last, Derek returns with projectiles. Yeah? Yep. We've got string to get put in that end now. Got to get, well, we've got to tap the end, but that's the uh, projectile. OK, excellent. We're going to put this on so we can get the back stops sort of like, yeah? OK. But they've still got to attach their string stabilizers. In the corner. We actually need a mirror for our barrel yep. uh, sighting. And we could also do with some thin rods to weld together. So we've got a large push rod in case, uh, heaven forbid, something gets stuck up our. Uh, we've actually got, we've got a broom. We've got a broom handle in there. Four, four, four meters long? Not quite that long. <laughs> Wait, is the gun horizontal at present? No. The Reds are keen to impress Kath with their large caliber weapon. What do you think, though? I think it looks fantastic. It, it looks look a lot more cannon like the next doors. Do you think this? There's do you think this will. Spindly. Do you think it'll show up with this? <laughs> you, you've only got half an hour left and you're worried about your decoration. That's the tip. It's got to look right. <laughs> the Colonel is making some last minute precision adjustments to their complex firing system. The Reds have even found time to knock up a basic sighting mechanism. I'm doing this so, so Dave can knock this over. Yeah, yeah. Where's the hammer? Tuck it on that side. Tuck it. Tuck it now. Tuck it now. Right. Gentlemen, this is your 15-minute warning. One five minutes to go. In the dying minutes, the Chemical Brothers are fitting a shield. Maybe they're worried the army boys will use them for target practice. Have well, we got the balls prepped? Yeah, they're there. What about your wadding? Uh, behind you, behind it. The, That's mucky, but we need some more, don't we? Those army boys are really cutting it fine, finishing those string stabilized projectiles. Okay. How many more of these you want to do? They're going to be cut into three foot lengths. Are we happy, Dave? We're happy. We're are we, very, we're are very, we happy? We're very happy. Now this is the last, this is Guts of Glory one, OK? Let's run Gentlemen, we are very close now. You have five minutes left. Five more minutes left of construction on, today. On, oh, no, 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 no. Okay. You can not bounce it. It's going to smash it. It's going to be hold it. Right. All right, time to take it. Come on, come on. Five minutes. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well That, believe it or not, is their long-awaited projectile. That is a very sexy-looking projectile. Those Chemical Brothers have even found time to give their gun a quick coat of paint in the team colours. Chemical Brothers, brothers in arms, the time has come, the sun has set, it is time to down your tools. Tonight, sleep well, for tomorrow, we do battle. Except I won't be there because I'm a wet liberal. I'm going to be in the bunker. <laughs> <laughs> How good does that look? Yeah! Are they going to be sexy going down the range or what? <laughs> Will the army boy's hydraulic pipe turn supergun win the shootout? Or will the Chemical Brothers' mains gas tube blow away the opposition? Find out in part three.
welcome to part three, where we put our cannons to the ultimate test, Big Bang. Here we are at DERA, the UK's Defence Evaluation and Research Agency at Shoebury Ness in Essex. It's where the Ministry of Defence tests big boys' guns. It's getting close, I can hear it. I can what? hear it. Then I would suggest probably that, yeah. Our team's efforts probably wouldn't pass DERA's simplest checkup, but our budding bombardiers are raring to go. Okay, gentlemen, the rules of engagement, very simple. You'll each get three attempts to hit the targets, which will be on the horizon. Whoever gets closest to the bullseye will be the winner. Best of luck. Gentlemen, the enemy are on the seawall behind us. So prepare to move your cannons. On my mark, fall in! At this distance, aiming at the targets is pretty much a point-and-shoot affair. This is a dangerous business, and the teams are being supervised by DERA personnel. Hold it about there. Kath and I feel our talents are best employed in a lead-lined bunker some distance from the action. The teams will join us shortly. Chemical Brothers, load your weapon! The Reds will be the first to light the blue touch paper on their traditional black powder cannon. In goes the explosive black powder. Then the cannonball in its wadding. There's no joking around now. Their loaded cannon is like an unexploded bomb. It's a tense moment as they prepare the fuse to ignite their black powder charge. OK, clear. Check. The teams will be firing the guns remotely from this splinter-proof personnel shelter. It might look like a jerry-built tin box, but we've been assured it can take the blast of an exploding cannon. The Purples are in another bunker watching how their rivals fare on CCTV. Stand by. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire. <laughs> the gun worked, but they missed the target by several yards. How fast did the shot go? Insta. What's the velocity? That's 262.5 metres per second. They're chuffed, because if it's a tie or neither team hits the target, the highest velocity will decide the winner. Our high speed camera shows the cannonball leaving the gun at 590 miles an hour enough to blast off one of their wussy moped shock absorbers. Time for the army to show the civilians how it's done. Brothers in arms, load your cannon. Let's do it. Right, let's take a barrel forward. Take a barrel forward. Gonna just get this is... In goes the string stabilized projectile. Derek watches anxiously. It looks a bit of a tight fit. Stop, stop, stop. Right, where's the mark? Whip that out, take a, pull, take a pull out, take a stick out. Right. Time to rig the mousetrap firing okay. mechanism. We ready? Yeah, okay. off you go. There's its cordite charge. Okay. I've, I've got that. I've, You're that, Bob. Yeah, I've got a bit more. The gun is now armed and dangerous. That's going to be set very gently on it. Yeah, the commission to fall out. You may fall out, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Good luck. <laughs> OK. Come on, Derek, let's go and see what happens. Let's run. The purples leg it to the shelter. They'll trigger the gun from there. Even Major Reed looks a bit nervous. Just before we do the second fire, can you just explain why, when you're doing your countdown, you miss out number five? Yeah, we don't say number five because it sounds too much like fire. And if they've missed a couple uh... of numbers on the way and they hear the first bit of it, fi, they could press the button before we're ready for them. Yikes. Right. OK. <laughs> so that. We'll stick to that. All stations look in. Brothers in arms, cannon. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, four, three, two, one, fire. Oh, oh yes! <laughs> is that, is that what happened? Oh, uh, no 
shot seen coming out, but everything seems to have gone off. Break cover. I'll just go and check it. Well, let's see that again. Well, the mousetrap firing mechanism actually works. But the projectile gets stuck inside the barrel, and the whole thing gets blown off the carriage. It's there. We actually travelled three yards. But they can't get the projectile out. This calls for desperate measures. Bring the pole. Bring the pole. We'll get it cut. Dick's supergun has to be cut down to get rid of the blockage. We will return. The barrel will lose a few feet, but over the distance they're firing, it shouldn't affect accuracy too much. There it is. Talk about a smoking gun. That projectile's well and truly stuck. We want, we want it like that, OK? Because if it comes down here, that's fine. We can just chop that out. Yeah. The Chemical Brothers' moped shock absorbers just weren't up to the job. Now they'll have to improvise, or their gun might go walkabout when they fire again. I would say, I would say five, then that, that'll hit that and press these back. We don't want about to stay The Brothers in Arms are guessing that their projectile's fancy nylon stabilising gizmo melted and gunged up their barrel. So they're cutting that down to size too. We're just hoping size doesn't matter because we've had to whop a meter off the end of it. Right. No. So this is going in naked. Shorter, with, a, with, a short, with a shorter tail. Right. But the, the uh, propellant itself. That was original. Right. Oh, right. Oh, so it's had a major haircut, actually. <laughs> and we're down to about a three meter cap. What did you do? It was too long before. It was unwieldy. So it's hopefully second time lucky. So, Major Reed, one hit down for each team. What's your analysis? Purple well, team first, brothers in arms. The purple team, what went wrong is they had a fairly tight fitting projectile right. and a fairly large chamber area. So effectively, projectile starts to move and then what became what we called a sticker. So it threw everything else <laughs> out to the, the rear. Term. The sticker, sticker, so it stayed in the barrel. And what about the chemical brothers? The chemical brothers, going well, got a good velocity, about 260 metres per second. Good velocity, went over the top, so hopefully they've done some running repairs. They're going to aim a bit lower this time. Excellent. So, almost ready for round two. Almost ready for round two. Seconds away. All stations, uh, Chemical Brothers, round two. Stand by. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, four, three, two, one. Fire. Oh, yes! Yes! It's only one piece. This time the blast blows away their shield, but it's a fantastic shot, right on the edge of the bullseye. Come on. Look at that! The Reds race to check it out. Look at this! That we, is super. We could do even better if we had a jigsaw on that. Okay. The triumphant Reds retire to their bunker for the purple second firing. Brothers in Arms, round two. Stand by. Ten. It's nine, crunch time for the Brothers eight, in Arms. Can they seven, salvage the honour of the six, regiment? Four, three, two, one. Fire! Oh, no! Oh, wow. What, we're still burning? It's on fire. It's on fire? What do we do now, boys? Yes! 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 Woo! And are you sure that, that, you're, that means there's no, nothing going yeah. on? No, no, no. no. You can tell you tell. I suppose you'd see stuff yeah. out the front, even if it blew off. MV, can you make anything out of that, or is it just debris you've got? Just debris. Looking just debris. OK. Once again, their fancy projectile has got stuck and propelled the barrel forward. And this time, a lump of burning cordite has been thrown out of the back for good measure. What will they do for their finale? <laughs> Colonel Dick's extensive weapon is really being cut down to size. Their projectile doesn't look quite so sexy anymore. We can't actually risk those rounds anymore, yeah? We've got a choice for our last shot. We've got grape, yeah? And we've actually got another one of those. No doubt of two. I wouldn't even think about doing a third one, yeah? We're a bit of a busted flush, aren't we? That projectile's practically welded itself into the barrel. They're just taking the crudders around a bit. Let's get the barrel back in. It's the unkindest cut of all for Colonel Dick's supergun. It's down from a proud four yards to an apologetic six feet. Ah. Is that your tummy? Yes. Whoa, I saw one. But those crafty army boys have a secret weapon up their sleeve. For their final firing, they're using grape shot. Basically a handful of nuts and bolts wrapped in felt. 
It's desperation stakes, but if one of those nuts reaches the bullseye, they could win. If I had to resort to something slightly, slightly different. Slightly shorter barrel, and you're going for grape shot, the grape shot option. Yeah, right? too solid, uh, Ryan, didn't go through. No. Yeah, and so if, when we looked inside the actual barrel, there's some striations, it looks a bit sort of juddered its oh, way right. down. It's going yeah. like that. Right. So what we're going for is something that will definitely go through. Yeah, yeah. Defin that will definitely go through. Are you going for the same charge size, you're going for a bigger charge? Well, as much as we can get in there, actually, because this time it's do or die. Go and quite honestly, if it goes kaboomy, it's not the end of the world. No. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be, you know, go down with a big bang. <laughs> Kathy? Yeah. The chemical brothers aren't happy. Um, we've just got a question. Right. They're going to be firing a large amount of shot. Yes. Okay. And we're just the concerned... The blunderbuss approach, they're, they're blunderbuss desperate. It. If they're going to hit the whole entire target... Yeah. How are you going to call this? Because one of them, you know, if there's going to be a large area of impact, one of them could easily go in the bullseye. Given that there wasn't a rule about what type of projectile you had to fire, I'm afraid that if one of their bits of nasty screw or bolt hits the middle of the target, then they win. It's war, boys. What can I say? It's dirty. That's what I say. <laughs> it's the Chemical Brothers' last shot. They've missed once and hold the target once. Can they put it through the bullseye and make it certain? Four, three, two, one. Fire. Yeah! They've hit again! <laughs> the back's come out. Insta. What's the velocity? Yes! 4.1. A good, consistent MV, but uh, no back on the gun anymore. The Reds are pleased with another hit, but it's not a bullseye. The Purples could still steal victory. Our footage shows the Reds' final shot reached 600 miles an hour and drilled another hole in their target. Everything rides on the Army's last shot. Can just one of their nuts and bolts hit the bullseye and save them from court martial? Brothers in arms, round three. Stand by. We'll rest on this one. Ten. It's a nail biter for the Reds, too. Seven, six, four, three, two, one. Fire. Yeah! It came up! It came up! It fired! But none of us can tell if one of those tiny pieces has hit the target. The speed looked good, though. The speed, see if we get any... At least it got up. Is it look fast? Does that look fast? MVs. That, that should be interesting, MVs. About 375. 375. 375. Thank you. <laughs> Supersonic. Supersonic. This time, the Army Boys projectile does leave the barrel, doing an impressive 850 miles an hour. <laughs> The brothers in arms target is untouched. Well done, lads. The Chemical Brothers have thrashed the army team with gunpowder and the balls off an old iron bedstead. Good luck and well done, mate. Well done. Well done. That's a fantastic victory for the Chemical Brothers. You're through to the semi finals. Well done, lads. Well done. Well done. Congratulations to Brothers in Arms. And we'll see you next week on Scrap Heap Challenge. Oh, oh yes. Yes, And that's how it's really done. On next week's show... You know you want the vehicle? There's a couple of cars out there and there's a Land Rover. Old scrappy pan Bowser Munson and a bunch of mad bikers take on a team of the Royal Navy's finest. Oh, you crashed it. The challenge? To build an amphibious vehicle. Bit of a crash there.